good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible and join me in Galatians chapter 6. And if you need a Bible, there's one there in the pew in front of you, and that's there for you to use. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can take that home with you, just as a gift from us to you. And uh, we'd love for you to have a copy of Scriptures in your hand at home. And also, we're getting ready to have, we're going to have the Lord's Supper at the end of our time uh, together this morning. And so if you are a believer, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're in good standing if you're a member of this church or a good standing with a member of a church and you're maybe just a guest with us today. Uh, we want you to, to participate with us. And so if you did not get one of these when you came in this morning, if you would just lift your hand. I see John over here. We'd love to, love to get one to you. Um, we have somebody up in the balcony as well. So don't, don't be shy. Just raise your hand. And I uh, see some there in the back. But just keep that hand up and they'll eventually find you. And that way you can participate with us. Uh, toward the end of this service, right down here. Um, well, this morning as we think about the text, um, I want us to consider um, what we do when we gather here. And there are a lot of reasons people attend a particular church. Sometimes it's the, the building or the location of the building. Sometimes it's a, uh, the people within the church. Uh, maybe there's a certain program that you appreciate within the church. But for us, our goal for you is we want to be up front. Um, we want to put you on a road to discipleship. And on that road, we've, uh, there are three stops for us that we want you to make and continue to travel. And uh, the first one is to believe. We want you to believe the gospel. We also want you to continue to deepen in your understanding of who God is and what he's done. And we want you to continue to grow deeper in what you believe. Another aspect of what we want to accomplish here as we gather in this place and scatter across our community is we want you to engage in community. We want you, we believe that the gospel not only changes our relationship with God, but it also changes our relationship with one another. And God brings us into community, the local church, together in order for us to grow in our relationship with Christ and to grow in our understanding of who he is and what he's done. And part of that for us is community groups. And so if you're not a part of a community group. They meet at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We also have some that meet in homes on Sunday evenings. One of our goals for you as a believer and a member of this church would be to connect with a community group, to engage in a community group, and then ultimately um, our hope is that you will live on mission, uh, that your faith will go beyond just the walls of this building but will be lived out in your home and in your neighborhood and that as you live out your faith, you will impact the world. You'll impact the nations. And so that is, our, that is the road we want to put you on, every one of us. That's the road I want to be on as I think about my relationship with God. And this morning, we're going to focus in on what it looks like to engage in community. What does it look like to, to do life with other believers? How do we do this? And um, what does it look like to um, fulfill the Great Commission, to be disciples and to make disciples? We've been talking about this last week uh, as we began talking about what it means to walk by the Spirit in the process called sanctification. And sanctification is a word we've been looking at, once again, for the past couple of weeks. But it's a, it's a big theological word, but simply, it simply means this. It's, it's the work, the ongoing work of God in your life in a relationship with you to make you look more like Jesus. And if you've ever become a Christian, if you've trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's a, that's a decision that happens in a moment, right? There's, there's, you're made a new creation, but that has worked out over the course of your life. And so last week we talked about what it looks like for you as an individual to become more like Christ as you walk by the Spirit. Well, sanctification is not just something you do, it's something that we do together. Sanctification is, is a group project. Uh, many of you probably had group projects in, in high school, or maybe you've had one in college. And uh, whenever you get put into a group project, you hope you get to choose your partners, right? You hope the teacher is not assigning you the group, because you know there are certain people that if they get in, their, in your group, they will do absolutely nothing. They'll just ride the coattails of the worker bees within the group. My friends, if that's you, shame on you, okay? Shame on you. Pull your weight in the group project. And in the same way, when it comes to sanctification, being a group project, being something that we all participate in, 
It's, it's, there's a, uh, last week we talked about the dependent responsibility we have on the Holy Spirit in us to grow in Christ's likeness. But there is also an interdependent responsibility that we have with one another. Uh, we're interdependent upon one another. And so each one of us has a responsibility to the other in this group project of sanctification. And as God works in my life to, to deal with my sin, to make me look more like Christ, to free me, right? We talked about a couple of weeks ago that we are free uh, from sin, not to sin. And so God is with you in this project, and his desire is to, is to continually free you from sin. I like how Dane Ortland puts it in uh, uh, Gentle and Lowly. He says this, God sides with you against your sin, not against you because of your sin. And that is a huge difference. And maybe you just need to hear that this morning. That God is not against you because of your sin. He is against, he sides with you against your sin. And one of the ways he does this is through other believers. And we have a hard time believing that. But one of the ways that God sides with you this morning and whatever struggle you're in, whatever sin that you're facing, whatever mountain you're climbing, one of the ways that God sides with you, God is for you, is in your, is in your community, that gospel community. Those people, other believers that he's put in your life. And so we'll see that this morning here in Galatians chapter 6. And so if you, if you pull the Pew Bible, it's on page 1034, and uh, I'm going to uh, confess something to you this morning. I didn't talk to Ellen about this, but I've been here almost 10 years, so it's time you probably know this. Um, I've been hiding something from you over the past few years. I cannot read the Bible without my glasses. Um, I've been struggling up here. I can change the font of my manuscript, but I cannot change the font of my Bible. And, uh, and I've been missaying words for years now. I mean, some of you have known this, but it's because I need these, and I've been too prideful to wear them. So here we go. All right? <laughs> Verse 1. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take them off as soon as I'm done. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some transparency this morning. So there you go. Verse 1, is, Paul writes these words, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with, with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. So this morning, as we think about this passage, I'd like for us to divide it up into three sections, okay? And in the first section, we're just going to call the situation. What is, what is the situation that Paul is dealing with here in Galatians chapter 6? And the situation is this, is there's a member within the community, perhaps members in the community, this is an ongoing thing, right? None of us, all of us at some point or another are going to struggle with sin in some way. There's a member of the gospel community here that's caught in sin, that's caught in sin. And this is within the church. You know, last week we talked about how if you are a Christian, there's going to be an ongoing struggle, intense struggle that you have with sin, right? We have, when you become a Christian, you become a new creation, but there's also the sinful nature that still lingers inside of you. And so there's going to be a struggle. And apparently here within the community, there is a brother or sister that's, that's really struggling with sin. Uh, someone is walking in disobedience and who claims to be a Christian, 
And as you read through the New Testament, you'll discover this. As believers, there's ways we're to interact with others within the church, with those who say, yes, I'm a Christian. There's also other ways we're to act around those who are not Christians outside the church. And we need to be careful that we distinguish between the two when we read through the New Testament. Okay? Um, we can't expect those outside the church to act like Christians. But there is an expectation for those of us who say we are Christians to act like Christians, to look more like Jesus. And that's who Paul is addressing here. He's saying those within the gospel community, when you see someone who's engaging in ongoing sin, then, then this is an issue. Something needs to be done. And once again, this doesn't mean that we confront every sin. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says this, above Paul writes, uh, Peter writes, above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers over a multitude of sins. So this doesn't mean that we're to nitpick, okay, and be critical anytime someone ever missteps. That's not the point here that Paul is making. Notice he uses the word overtaken. If someone is overtaken in wrongdoing, your translation may say caught in wrongdoing or caught in sin. This is a person who has stepped falsely and is trapped. This is a person who is straying away from Jesus. You begin to see this sinful pattern in their lives. Okay, this is a, a brother or sister who's maybe struggling with some type of addiction, and there are a number of them. This is maybe a brother or sister who's neglecting their family. They're so consumed by work and making money or consumed by something that they're ne- beginning to neglect their family. This is uh, perhaps someone who's involved in an ungodly relationship, and, and they're engaged in it. They're starting to get trapped in it. You see it's happening, but perhaps they don't. This is someone who's forsaking the gathering of believers. This is not someone who just misses a couple of Sundays. This is someone who, over a, a time, has shown a pattern of disregard for the significance of gathering with other believers. And as those who know the danger of sin, we know that that sin enslaves. We know that sin ultimately destroys. We must have concern for these folks, these believers. This this sin is beginning to control the person. It's becoming habitual. It's enslaving them and perhaps in ways they can't even see. This is the situation that, that Paul is addressing here. And then he provides for us the solution. Notice what he says the solution is. He says, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourself so that you will, you will also won't be tempted. And so the solution is this, is that those who are walking by the spirit are to care for that member, or to care for that person who is caught and overtaken in a wrongdoing. He says that the spiritual people within the church. Those who are spiritual should restore such a person. It's interesting. What does he, what does he mean by spiritual? Who, who are those who are spiritual? These, are these the super Christians? Are these who are perfect in everything they do? No, that, that, that no one would qualify. I think the spiritual person that Paul is referring to here, he's already been describing them in chapter 5. These, the spiritual people, are those who are seeking to walk by the Spirit. Those who are giving evidence that they are walking by the Spirit, by the fruit in their lives. In fact, the word gentle here, when he says that you are a spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. It's, it's the same gentleness we see in chapter 5 in verse 23, when it, when it talks about one of the fruits of the Spirit is gentleness. And so the person who is spiritual here is not, a, is not a super Christian, but it's someone who's walking in the Spirit, who's giving evidence that the Spirit is working in their life and they're producing fruit. This is someone who's putting to death what is already dead. We talked about that last week. Putting to death the, the sin that is already dead. And in verse 1, they are watching out for themselves. They don't go in there blindly with such confidence that they may not be tripped up over the same sin. No, those who are spiritual walk into a situation like this and come to our brother and sister with a certain amount of humility and with a concern for themselves too. They guard themselves knowing that they too could be overtaken by this sin. 
In other words, the spiritual person doesn't look at someone who's caught in sin and say, how could this person do such a sinful thing? How could they do something along like this? What's, what's wrong with this person? How stupid? No, the spiritual person with humility says this, but for the grace of God in my life, this could be me. That's how the spiritual person approaches someone who is, who is caught in sin. And when you see this person under the weight of sin, deceived by sin, you, you, your question is, what if this were me? What if, this, what if this was me? How would I want someone to, to love me? We're called to be restorative in the life of a brother or sister in Christ who is overtaken in this way. And this word restore, it's actually a medical term used to, to, to setting like a dislocated bone back in place. And uh, when I was uh, going through a growth spurt when I was younger, uh, occasionally when we'd be playing basketball or something, and I would have a kneecap that would pop out of place. And uh, a couple of times it stayed out of place, and the painful part was, was getting it back in place. It didn't look good out of place, but the, the pain getting it back in place was necessary in order to restore my knee. In the same way, sometimes correcting a brother or sister who's overwhelmed or, or struggling or trapped in sin, it can be painful at times. But the ultimate goal is, is restoration to lead towards healing. And so the solution here. Uh, the situation and the solution involves two different kinds of, of people. Uh, those who are caught up in sin, who, who will see their need, right? Because if you don't see the need, you're caught up in sin, you'll refuse the help. You'll put up a wall. And so there's, there's a person who's caught in sin, but then there's also those who, who are called to help and reach out to those with the understanding that any moment it could be them. And there'll be a time in your life, Christian, when you're, when you're one or the other. I don't know that any of us are, 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 are able to not be one or the other in some time in our life. And so we need the humility to go and, and help a brother, but we also need the humility to receive help from a brother or sister in Christ. This is this interdependent responsibility that we're to have to one another. And Paul writes, as you do this, in verse 2, you carry one another's burdens, you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ here that he's referring to, you, you can see in chapter 5, verse 14, for he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Or, or uh, Jesus would say it this way to his disciples, you love one another as I have loved you. This is why you were set free from being under the law. This is why Jesus came and, and gave you his righteousness because you, you, we were under the law. We didn't have any righteousness in and of ourselves, but you were set free in order to love others. You were set free from sin so that you can serve others. And there are many ways that we can serve one another. And within the church, I see this, uh, you do this so well in, in many ways. In the way that you care and you love for one another. If someone is physically sick or has some type of other physical need. In the way that you carry one another's burdens. But here, Paul is speaking in a very specific way that he's calling them to carry one another's burdens. And unfortunately... For many churches, and including ours, I would say, this is something that we don't feel comfortable often doing. Paul's calling them that they're called to not only fight for the physical needs of those around them, but the spiritual needs. He's calling them to, to fight for one another's holiness, to fight for one another's Christ-likeness as they gather together. And this is this burden that Paul is referring to, it's, it's one that's committed to seeing Christ formed in the people within the gospel community, within the churches. And this means sometimes being uncomfortable. It means sometimes 
interfering, what, what feels like interfering in someone else's life who's, who's caught up in sin. And once again, most of us don't feel qualified to do this. And I think there are many reasons for that. You know, all of us have our own issues. Nobody's perfect. Um, sometimes it just feels like it's too much. How can I help this person? I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Maybe there's been moments when, when you think about somebody you haven't seen in a while and they've just disappeared and you think, well, it's none of my business. Or, or maybe you, you're, you're fearful that it, maybe it will come across as if you're judging that person. In all these ways, we just don't often feel qualified to step into somebody's life and either hold them accountable or, or to challenge them maybe in, in some type of action or lifestyle they're living. And I'm going to tell you something this morning that, that may shock you. Listen, I don't feel qualified either to do that. You know, often what happens within the church is you'll speak to someone else about the person who's overtaken with sin, but you won't speak to them. Or you'll go and you'll, you'll call one of the, the pastors or call the pastor and, and say, hey, you, you need to, to step in here. My friends, I would say this, listen, it's not about qualifications, it's about love. Paul doesn't make this about being qualified, he makes this about love. And so whether you feel qualified or not, the question is, do you love that person? And if you love that person, then you will step in and you will seek to restore that person, gently restore that person in humility carefully, knowing that you yourself could be in this person's situation. This past week, I was up at the, the gym playing basketball. There were, uh, my 10-year-old daughter and one of her friends, um, we were shooting around, and uh, I had put this together, this little skills challenge. And one of the things that I did was I put these baseball mats out on the gym floor, and they're meant to be outside. They're not meant to be on the gym floor. And so, therefore, when I jumped on one of them to, to take a shot, uh, it slipped right out from under me. It's like I jumped on ice. And I hit the ground so hard. It's one of those moments where everybody in the gym just stops and they look down. And, uh, and they see if someone is still alive. I mean, it, it, felt that, it felt like somebody grabbed my, the bottom of my feet and took me and hit me on, on the ground. And so I, I, I'm not as young as I, I, I used to be. Um, you know that by now. I'm 49. I know you're like, whoa, really? Yes, it's true. I look good, but <laughs> it's true. I know you're shocked. As I was laying there on the ground, though, and every, everybody's eyes were on me. My daughter was on the other side. She came running because she just heard some loud thump and was, you know, just trying to figure out what it was. It was her dad. And, uh, and I, as I laid there on the ground, I, I, I didn't know it, it, I was, it hurt really, really bad. But the pride in me, right, just wanted to jump up off the ground. And so, um, so the nine and the 10 year old, they know this, right? If someone's hurting, you run over and you, you check on them. So they ran over and checked on me. I'm like, oh, oh, I'm okay. And I stood up. And as soon as I stood up, I, I felt like I was going to pass out again. That's how hard I hit the ground. And so I strolled over to the bleachers. And as I sat down the bleachers, they came over and were looking at me in the eye, just checking on me. And they were spinning. I couldn't focus on them. They were literally spinning um, in my eyes. Listen, if you physically fall, it doesn't matter the qualifications of the person, it matter, it's about their vicinity. You just need whoever's around to help you get up. And in that moment, listen, I, I, I didn't need a doctor, thankfully, but even if I did, I would hope that uh, the response of those around me wouldn't be just to walk away and say, well, it's, I, I don't know anything about helping someone who's physically hurt. Certainly a doctor will show up. No, if you love someone, you step in. If they're physically hurting, you step in and you help them up. And the same thing, church, spiritually. When someone is overtaken with sin, when you have a brother or a sister in Christ that is straying from the truth, that is not walking in the truth of the gospel, then once again, it's not about qualifications. It's about love. Are you going to love that person? We're called to fight for one another's holiness. And sometimes that means you being uncomfortable. 
Sometimes that means you stepping into the arena, uh, to an arena, to a situation where you don't feel qualified. You may not know what to say. You may not know what to, to do. But the Holy Spirit, as believers, as those who choose to walk by the Spirit, the Spirit is going to lead you in a way where you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Even in the most difficult circumstances when they can't even see they're trapped in sin. In verses 3 and 5, Paul goes on to talk about one of the reasons we don't do this. One of the biggest reasons that we don't often reach out and help a brother or sister in Christ who's caught in sin is because of our pride. Notice what he says there. He says, if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. He's speaking of pride here, isn't he? Pride is when you and I, when we have an inflated view of ourselves, when we have an exalted view of ourselves. And and pride is an enemy to love. If you are prideful, then you will find it hard to love people, specifically those people who are struggling with sin. If I have an exalted view of myself, then it is necessary for me to have a low view of you. And if I try to help you, then I'm going to have to lower myself in the process. So Paul would say, don't deceive yourself by making, uh, by judging yourself in light of others. I feel bad for you Titans fans. I appreciate the Titans. They suffered a painful loss yesterday to which us Cowboy fans say, get in line. (laughs) I know it hurts. I know what it feels like. You feel like you deserve better. And in fact, the Titans have actually beaten every other team left in the playoffs this year. They've beaten every one of them except Cincinnati. And so if, as a Titan fan, you might be tempted to think, well, if one of these other teams wins the Super Bowl, then you might be tempted to think, well, man, we're the best team. Right? We beat those other teams. We're the best team. That's called delusional. You lost. A win by comparison is no win at all. Not on the football field, and that's Paul saying, not even in your relationship with God or your relationship with others. The person who thinks he is something by comparison deceives himself. It is not comparison with another person that provides a true assessment of who you are and where you are in life. No, this is faulty thinking. This is the thinking of the Pharisee. Remember, Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, and they're going into the temple and pray, and the Pharisee's standing before God, and he's saying, I'm so thankful I'm not like that tax collector. He's comparing himself, assessing himself based upon someone else. And ultimately, the tax collector says, God, have mercy on me, for I am a sinful man. And who goes home justified? What's the point of the story? Who goes home justified? It's not the person, it's not the Pharisee who who compares himself, who judges himself in light of others. It's the tax collector who understands his sin and his guilt before God. He's the one who goes home justified. In the same way, Paul would say, listen, you need to examine your life before you go and start to take pride in yourself and comparing yourself to this other brother or sister who's struggling. And you're thinking, well, I'm too busy to help this person. That's pride. Before you go down that road, you need to examine your own life, not in light of who they are, but before a holy God. You were accountable to God, a holy God, for your life for your load. And it may seem like Paul is contradicting himself because in one moment he says, hey, carry one another's burdens. But then he's also saying for each person will have to carry his own load. Well, he's specifically using two different words there. That's not the same word. When he says that each person is to, or we're to carry one another's burdens, those burdens are, are, are things that come in life that are too heavy for one person and should be shared. The, the load here he's speaking of often is, it refers to a, a backpack. If you were in the military, a pack that you would wear on your back, it's something that you have to carry. It's, it's not too heavy for one person, 
No, it's designed for one person. And so what Paul's saying here is there's a mutual responsibility that we have to one another within the gospel community. That we're to help one another when, when we see someone who's, who's caught in sin. Obviously, they can't get out. There's a mutual responsibility that we have for one another. But he's also saying there's a personal responsibility that we have before God. To live faithfully with what God has given and entrusted to us. That we're to help one another and, and help carry other people's lo- uh, burdens. But at the same time, we're going to stand before God one day. And he's not going to judge us in comparison to anyone else. He's going to judge us based upon the load. He's going to, he's going to, we're going to have to give an account for the life we've been given. For that load. And then in verse 6 he goes on, and it seems a little out of place, but I think what he's doing here is he's, he's giving them exa- another example of how to carry one another's burdens. In verse 6 he says, let the one who has taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. This verse speaks of supporting the teachers within the churches. The teachers would have given themselves to the word, to the ministry of the word. They would have been, out, been able to be out and, and making necessarily a living for themselves. This would have been difficult to do and still minister to the body, to the church. And so he's saying, listen, let those who receive the teaching, let this be a mutual thing where they're caring for one another. Those who are teaching the word, you give yourselves to love the people through teaching the word. And then in return, let those who receive the word share all good things with the teachers. And then in verses 7 through 10, Paul goes back to what he's speaking of, I think, earlier and kind of sums it all up. And let's read these words again, starting at verse 7. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows in the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. So what, what is Paul doing here? He's giving them a, a divine uh, principle here to emphasize the eternal importance of walking in the Spirit. Not only of personally walking with the Spirit, but also looking out for your brothers and sisters, encouraging them to be obedient to God, to walk in the Spirit. And notice the significance here. Right? We've had the, 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 the problem. We've had the, the solution to the problem. And then uh, now we have the significance of this whole thing. And he said, and, and he's... Basically, I'll summarize it in this way. The way that we live before God and love one another has eternal consequences. That what, I, what he's saying right now, it shouldn't be taken lightly. Personal holiness and calling others to live a life and challenging others and helping other people live a life of holiness is it's not something that we can afford to neglect. The stakes are too high. Earlier, Paul had warned them not to be deceived into thinking they were something when they're nothing. And here, he warns them to not be deceived into thinking that God can be treated as if he is nothing. They shouldn't treat themselves as if they're something when they're really nothing. And and they dare not look at God and treat him as if he is nothing. Because God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. And he uses the, the illustration of, of sowing and reaping. There's a plant called the, I'm not a botanist, but I, I'm familiar with the Chinese bamboo. And basically the Chinese bamboo, if you plant some in the ground and you water it and feed it and put it in sunlight, after a year, you will see absolutely nothing. If for two years you water it and feed it and give it the nutrients it's need, after two years you will see absolutely nothing. After three years you will not see anything. After four years you probably still won't see anything. But after five years you'll see that plant, five years of watering and giving it what it needs, you'll see it begin to surface from the ground. And then after it surfaces, that bamboo is one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing plant in the world. In fact, they say it can even grow 35 inches a day. And over the course of weeks, it can grow up to 90 feet. So how long has that plant been growing? Is it just a few weeks? No, it's years. 
but it took years for it to finally surface. In the same way, I think this is what the example what Paul is giving here. Listen, when it comes to living by the Spirit and sowing by the Spirit, living a life that's uh, submitting to God in obedience, it may not show immediate results. And the same thing with the person who's disobedient to God, who's continually chooses to walk by the flesh and sows the sinful nature. Listen, be careful. It may not show immediate results, but God will not be mocked. What you sow, you will reap. And in the moment, it may not seem as if there's any consequences. But listen, church, believer, do not be deceived. There is always a delay in sowing and reaping, but eventually the seeds you sow will come to fruition, will appear, and the person who continually lives in disobedience, the person who continually looks at God and ignores God and treats God as if he is not God, the one who rejects God, maybe in a moment or, or perhaps we'd say here, listen, outwardly or inwardly over time, that person, Paul would say, will experience destruction in their life. Every time, listen, every time you disobey God, you continually disobey God, live to that sinful nature, you plant a seed. Don't be deceived. And it may be a year, it may be five years, but it will be seen. In the same way, take heart, those of you who are struggling with sin, those of us who, all of us, all of us as we struggle to live holy lives, listen, take heart in this, that every time you give yourself to the work of the Spirit, every time you submit to God's leading, take heart. You may not see the results in a moment, but you keep going. You keep being faithful in obedience to God because His promise is this, is that those who sow in righteousness will eventually see Eternal life, it'll spring forth and it will be glorious because even in the moments when we can't see anything, for those of us who are living, giving yourself to the Spirit, God is doing something glorious in you. So ultimately in verses 9 and 10, he would say, don't give up. If you're struggling with sin, don't give up. Don't give up. If you're giving in to sin, be careful. Be leery. God will not be mocked. But as you fight the good fight, listen, that means for your own personal holiness, maybe it's you fighting on behalf of a brother and sister. And listen, I know you can grow weary. But don't give up fighting on behalf of that brother or sister in Christ. Fight for their holiness. Don't give up. Let us not get tired of doing good, Paul would write, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Keep sowing. Keep walking by the Spirit. Keep sowing and keep calling others within the gospel community to do the same. And for you this week, that may mean making a phone call. Perhaps there's a brother or sister in Christ you just haven't seen in a while. And you don't know where they are and you've just said, well, they're doing whatever they want to do. It's none of my business. Well, it is your business. If you're in their proximity, if God has laid you on their heart, if you've noticed that it is your business, or if you have a brother or sister in Christ who's struggling with with sin in some way and you, you know it, my friends, it is your business. Now, Jesus would say, listen, make sure you get that, that, that plank out of your own eye before you go and try to move, remove the speck in their eye, but, but do something. Don't sit there as if There are not real consequences at stake here. Don't sit there as if their life, step after step, could be in the direction of destruction. Because God will not be mocked. 
So let's fulfill the law of Christ by loving one another as Christ has loved us. And oh, how he has loved you and oh, how he has loved me. That while we were his enemies, while we were running from him, while we were shaking our fist at him, oh, how Christ loved us. As he didn't keep us from arm's distance, but he left heaven and ultimately was nailed to a cross so that we might be saved, so that we might know freedom from sin, so that we might love one another. He has carried your load. And now he asks you to carry the loads of one another. We want to continue thinking on that this morning as we take of the Lord's Supper together. And so I want to invite you to take the cup this morning. As we take this, listen, I hope, I hope that you'll be reminded that you have a God who is for you against sin. If you ever doubt that God is for you against sin, then, then the cross is, 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 you need to ponder the cross. Because that's how much God is for you against sin. So as Jesus gathered with his disciples that night, before he was arrested or the night he was arrested he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples he said do this in remembrance of me That same night he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, remember me.